Well, good morning, everybody. We welcome you to Gateway Community Church on this beautiful spring Sunday morning. It is Sunday, April the 14th in the year of our Lord 2024, the third Sunday in the season of Easter. And we are so grateful that God has given us this opportunity to gather together in this place to worship his holy name. My name is Thayer Stamper. It's my privilege to be the pastor here at Gateway, and I especially want to thank you for choosing to worship along with us. If today is your first time with us, or if you've never done this, before we'd love to just know a little bit more about you to know who you are if you could take just a few minutes to complete the connection card it's just right there in the row in front of you right there in this little side pocket or the, the back pocket just pull it out fill it out take it by the guest services counter on your way out this morning we've got something special we want to give you as our way of saying thank you for being our guest and if you'd rather do that on your phone feel free to do that you can scan that little QR code it's on the screen uh, back there behind me it has something to, uh, we call church center here it's just a way for us to digitally connect with you guys. And uh, you can fill that out. Say, I'm new to Gateway. It's also very handy if you want to register for any of our events, if you want to register for baptism, if you want to know more about us, all of those kind of things. Church Center app is for you. It's very easy to do. So however you are inclined, if you're more of an analog person with a card or more of a digital person with your phone, you use that. Let us know that you are here. And as we begin our time of worship today, we're thankful that God, of course, has given us his word. We're not just feeling blindly in the dark to try to discover who he is, but he has revealed himself to us. What a wonderful and marvelous gift it is. And, of course, we are going to draw much attention to the scriptures as a part of our service today. And we're going to begin by reading from passages in the Psalms today. We're going to read Psalm 17 verses 6 and 7. I'm going to ask you guys, let's all stand together. Let's all read God's word together, and then we are going to begin our time of worship today. The scriptures read like this, I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful that your right hand is powerful and mighty to save. That in your great wisdom, God, you oversee all of your creation, that you take care of it in your providence, and that, Father, that you tenderly and lovingly care for it all. We thank you today, God, that as made in your image that we human beings are special among all the rest of creation. None other can claim that particular designation, God. We alone. And you have made us for yourself. And God, we are made for relationship with you. We thank you that that relationship is offered to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because we are good, because we are fallen in our sin, but because he is perfect. And because he substituted himself on the cross at Calvary to pay the debt for our sin, to pay the penalty for our sin. God, he did that so that we may be forgiven and so that we may be brought into your family. And in that light today, God, we gather to worship you. Not trying to earn your love, and not trying to get something from you to manipulate you. But God, in gratitude with hearts that are full, God, of just thankfulness toward you, knowing that you always do what is best for your people who are called by Jesus' name, we gather here in this place. We ask that you accept our worship as we offer it to you freely, that our songs would be pleasing to you, God, that our gifts would be pleasing to you, that our attentiveness today and our willingness to trust and obey would be pleasing to you. And we give you all the glory and the praise, God, for what you're going to do here in this place. And we pray all of these things today in Jesus' wonderful, marvelous, and matchless name. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship him today. Good morning, church. Let's lift up a song to our Savior, the Lord Jesus. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our 
souls to Him belong Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart of His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality.
Shining 
Acknowledging the truth of everything that God has revealed in his word, trusting in him, and also receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he has offered to us in the gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts because you are a sufficient Savior. We confess that born in Adam, in sin, that we are hopeless. Though made in your image, all potential is ruined in us because of sin. We acknowledge that hard truth. But God, we are so thankful that you have redeemed us from sin. We thank you, the triune God, for working our salvation, not according to our own works, not according to our lineage, not according to where we come from or what language or people we are a part of, but according to your own purpose of grace, that you, the Father, have a perfect will. You, the Son, are the Lamb who was slain. And by the Spirit, this work is done. And by the Spirit, this work is applied to us. That you, a holy, righteous God, would be glorified through redemption. And we thank you. We thank you that this truth, it doesn't just stand as a message. It stands in our own lives. You hold us. You keep us. You work through us with power so that our lives are changed. And so, Lord, we just commit to you a, a moment of just saying, thank you, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your transforming power in our life. We are no longer dead in sin. Today, God, through your word, would you teach us and help us to understand what it means to be your people, understanding the narrative of 1 Corinthians 15, understanding the narrative of redemption, to be thankful for how you have worked, to be thankful that when we go to your word, we go to absolute truth. Lord, help us, those who battle with subjective truth, to look to your word this morning and find objective truth. Help us, God, to be changed by what it says and to hold to it by faith. We believe this and we ask for your help in this. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said together, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you.
to week three of our series on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look specifically uh, beginning at verse 12 and moving through verse 19 today. But uh, how many of you, uh, let's just say, how, how many of you would say you're, you're movie fans? Anybody here in the house like to go to movies, all right? How many of you like to watch movies at home? All right, how many of you, re Netflix revolutionized your life? All right, for, for, for so many people, that's just kind of the, the way that it is. But I want you to think about uh, some of the most pivotal movies uh, that you've seen in your lifetime. Uh, for my generation, perhaps one of the most pivotal movies that to ever come along was the movie Back to the Future. Anybody remember Back to the Future? Back to the Future, 1985, okay? 1985, it's 13 years old. We're about to turn 13 years old. We went to uh, see Back to the Future in the movie theater, and you're familiar with the storyline of Marty McFly uh, finding himself uh, in, a, in a family that, that's got all kinds of troubles, but then suddenly he is transformed and taken back to the year 1955 uh, because he has a mission to make sure that his parents are ultimately going to end up together or else he's not going to exist. And you're familiar with all of that, and it's going back 30 years in the future, but do you realize that Back to the Future itself is just a year shy of being 40 years old? Okay, that movie is so pivotal for folks in my generation. A lot of the things that they saw, and you know, you think about the the, the technology that they anticipated later on in the the, the further movies in vote, but two and three, some of that that they anticipated still hasn't come to pass. And you think about hoverboards, and think about skateboards as hoverboards, still not yet really on the scene in the way that they imagined them. But the world of 1985, thinking about the year 2015, okay, thinking about the year 2025. Yes, all of those things are, are, are still kind of on the horizon, but the story of the original was what if, what if something had never happened? What if my parents had never come together? What if I could change the future by looking at the past, all right? How many of you have ever asked that question? What if I had made this decision in the past rather than this one? What if my parents had made this decision rather than the latter. Now, you know, you can do that all day long. You can think about it all day long, and sometimes it can be fun to imagine in some sense, but, you know, going down that rabbit hole, coulda, shoulda, woulda, a lot of times it can, can be kind of counterproductive. But, but think about this. You know, not only do we have movies that talk, go about personal history, but we also have an entire genre of literature and, and movies even that talk about not just individual decisions about your parents coming together, but, but what if particular things in history that we knew happened didn't really happen or didn't turn out the way that we had been taught or the way that we had anticipated Listen, some of you may be familiar with this, but there's an entire genre of literature called alt history. Alt history. And perhaps some of the most famous ones, and you, you think about the clash of two eagles, thinks about this, all right? Imagine a world in which the Roman Empire still exists, all right? Now, that's a very famous meme today, that if you think about that uh, in, in, in terms of social media, the, the Roman Empire, does it still exist today? Well, imagine a reality in which the Roman Empire still existed. And the clash of two eagles tells us the story of how the Roman Empire would ultimately come to America in the year 1215 and then run into the Mongols who are coming in from the other side, okay? So there is an invasion of America. Later on, you're going to have not, not the English coming over, and you're not going to have the French exploring. You're not going to have the Spanish coming, but you're having this alt history of something that is imagined in the future about what would the past look like and what would the future ultimately look like had this come to play had this come into play how about this one you think about um the, think about the the um the jubilee story uh written by ward moore what if the south had won the battle of gettysburg okay what would the world look like 
today. Or Colson Whitehead's book, The Underground Railroad, all right? The Underground Railroad, we know that that is something that ultimately existed, but as Colson Whitehead is writing, he's writing about it as something that is literally an underground railroad that moved slaves from one part of the country to the other in order for them to be able to escape, that it was intricately built. All of these things kind of go in. What if this were the case. Some of you may be even familiar with Philip K. Dick's um, book called The Man in the High Castle. Some of you don't know the book, but you know the Amazon series that imagines a world in which not America and the Allies won World War II, but the Germans and the Japanese won World War II. And you think about those things and the way that they play out in America, how that the storyline goes in that, how the West Coast is controlled by the Japanese and the East Coast is controlled by the Germans. And you're having all of these things that are coming together and America is no longer free and the Jews are still in hiding and there is slavery that's been reintroduced. All of these things that are a part of what they would call alt history. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something, that you can go down all kinds of rabbit trails. You can go down all kinds of rabbit holes. But do you know that Paul, that Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, goes into a bit of speculative alt history, okay? Speculative alt history. What if, what if, if this, then that. If not this, then what? what is to come. You've perhaps never thought about it in that kind of way, but remember that 1 Corinthians 15 is about the importance of the resurrection. And not just Christ's resurrection, but the importance of the, of the resurrection and how foundational it is for you and for me to believe it. Not just that Christ was raised from the dead, but that all those who are called by his name are going to be raised from the dead. You think about Christianity as a whole, and what is the goal of Christianity? Of course, the goal of Christianity is to bring people into the kingdom of God. Now, why is that important? Because God is going to remake everything that is broken in this world. There is a new creation coming. Whenever we sing that song, he is. We think about those words. Is a new creation coming? Yes, absolutely it is. And the old things are going to pass away, and the new things are going to come. This new creation is going to be inhabited by people that are in this life now who give themselves to Christ and are going to become a part of that creation. All right, The old has passed away. The new has come. It's not just about you getting right with God and your salvation right now, and that's an important part of it, but God is going to remake everything and everyone who is remade on the inside now by being made new in Jesus Christ is going to be fully made new when the new creation comes, all right? That's why the resurrection is so important because a new thing is coming and are you ready? But Paul, talking about these Corinthians, some people are in that day going, yeah, I just don't get this resurrection thing. Why is it that we have to do this resurrection thing? Why is it that we can't just follow Christianity as just another one of the alternative religions that, uh, that are so prolific and rife within the Roman Empire? Why is it that this is so important? Why is it so foundational for us? Well, Paul is going to let us know, okay? Paul is going to let us know because if Christ is not raised from the dead, then there are some certain implications that go along with it, okay? What if? What if, and if Christ is not raised from the dead, where do you and I find ourselves? And we pick up the story here in verses 12 through 19, and we're going to have the words on the screen behind me. You can follow along in your Bibles as you have them, or you can follow along on the screen as well. But the Scriptures read like this. It says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead, all right? So that's an introductory kind of question, but notice the if is already there. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. 
Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. All right? You count the word if over and over and over in that statement, okay? If this is true, then this is true. Now, some of you may have taken geometry back when you were in high school. Remember, if-then statements, hypothesis. How many of you had to do science projects when you were a kid, all right? How many parents are struggling through science projects with their kids now, all right? That's the bigger thing. That's the bigger thing because hypothesis is whenever you're conducting an experiment, an experiment is what you think is going to happen. And basically, the way that you conduct the experiment is to see whether or not your hypothesis is true, all right? If the situation and if the experiment turns out the way that you think it will, then your hypothesis is true. If it does not turn out that way, then your hypothesis is going to be false, all right? You think about if and then statements. If you count the word if and then in this statement, you're going to find, or in this paragraph, you're going to find it over and over and over and over again. Now, Paul starts off, he says, now, how is it? How is it that some of you can say that there isn't any resurrection from the dead? How any of you, how is it that any of you can just say that this isn't a part of the gospel? In fact, we look at verses 1 through 11, Paul says that the gospel is incomplete without the resurrection. If we don't have the resurrection, and it's not a part of the original message, and not a part of the message that I gave to you in Corinth, and not a part of the message that we preach today here in Pikeville, North Carolina, we're preaching an incomplete gospel. So therefore, how is it, how is it that you can come to terms with this kind of teaching that tells us that the resurrection really really isn't real. Because consider the implications. Consider the alt history. Consider the alt future if Christ is not really raised from the dead. There's three things I want you to see that Paul says. If Jesus isn't really raised from the dead, then you can't count on as well. All right? If Jesus isn't really raised from the dead, you're going to call yourself a Christian? Look, you just might as well go home. And that word in vain shows up again. We've seen that twice already in this chapter. You're believing in vain. We're preaching in vain. We're preaching in vain again. Paul is saying this all together to say this is so very important because if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, first of all, there's three things today. First of all, understand this, that our message is in vain. Our message is in vain. How many of you enjoy sleeping in on the weekends. Anybody? How many of you can sleep in on the weekends? All right, there's a big difference between being willing to and being able to, all right? Big difference. Some of you are going to wake up at the same time regardless. Some of you have a kid that's going to wake you up at the same time regardless. Some of you have a dog or a cat that's going to decide that, hey, 5 a.m. is a wonderful time to have the zoomies, or I need to eat, Or I need to come and knead, what do they say, making biscuits. Your cats make biscuits on the bed, or sometimes they make it on you, all right? They just decide, hey, now is a great time to be able to do that. But let me just tell you something. Today would have been a great day to sleep in if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, all right? If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, there's no reason for us to come here today. There's no reason for us to sing There's no reason for me to open up this book and tell you anything about it. There's no reason for us to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because, folks, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, Paul says a lot of things about it. He says, we are of all people to be pitied, all right? Or we are of all men most miserable, okay? We're just going through the motions for no reason, all right? We're no different from those other empty gods that they worship in those other full temples that have no message other than to try harder and to work harder, and you're still going to die at the end of the day, and there is no hope, or perhaps there will be some hope if you've done enough, and if this standard that you kind of hold in your mind that may or may not be true depending on the God's mood on any particular kind of day, you may or may not have an afterlife that's worth Worth living. Just go through the motions. Just do all of those things. Hey, Paul says, if our message doesn't include a surefire resurrection, then folks, we might as well sleep in. There's no point. No point to lie. Music may make you feel good. You may feel good if you drop something there in the, in, in the offering boxes. You may feel good to see each other for a little bit, but 
at the end of the day, you know what? You can support other charities. You can listen to the radio to sing. And you can hang out with other people in your neighborhood. But if the message is true, and folks, the message, the resurrection, <laughs> is worth proclaiming. And it's worth reminding of ourselves of. Because here in this place today, you know, you may be, you may be a Christian for a long time. You may have been a Christian for a long time. But here's the deal. You need consistent reminder of what God has done for you. Not that you're just meant to wallow in your sin and just wallow as a worm in the dirt and to think about how miserable and gross you are, all right? Now, that's not what church really is all about. Yes, we need to feel miserable and we need to feel gross and we need to feel in such a way that, that apart from God's grace, there we absolutely are nothing and have nothing before we come to faith in Christ. We never come to faith in Christ if you think you're something, all right? You'll never come to faith in Christ if you think you're enough. You'll never come to faith in Christ if you think you don't need any help. Folks, we need help, and it's beyond help. We need gracious help. Right? We need God to pull us out of the doldrums. So, yes, we need to be pulled out of the pit. But at the same time, once we are pulled out of that pit, folks, we don't need to stay in the pit. We don't need to stay down there. We need to remember who we are. But we remember who we are in Christ and that we are his children and that we are loved by him and that he gave his son for us and that he has brought us into his family and that we have this future and we have this hope. And yes, we come into this place to remind ourselves of that. And we may be going through all kinds of troubles and tribulations. Your life right now may be, as a Christian, the closest to hell that you'll ever be in but it still feels just like hell, all right? But you have a future, and you have a hope, and you need this message because you need to be reminded of that truth. Yes, our message, our message of the gospel means that you are part of God's family and that you have a future and that life as it is right now is not all that life is going to be, but that in Christ you have a hope of life beyond death and a real life beyond death. As Christians, we need reminding of that. But as you today may be coming in this door, and you may not be a Christian, you may not be a Christian, all right? You may be just kind of walking like a, walking as you would by a swimming pool, you know, kind of putting your foot there in the water. Anybody do that? You walk by the swimming pool? Maybe that's the way you come to church today. I'm going to put my foot in the water and see what's going on there with these people. See why they sing, you know? See why the parking lot is full. See why it is they give coffee. See why it is they sing. See why it is they have these lights. Let me tell you something. Those things serve a greater purpose and a message. And they are a part of the gospel message that you need to hear this morning. If you are not in Christ, let me tell you something. The gospel message to you is that God loves you despite your sin. You come to him for salvation, and you find it in him alone. And you repent and believe. Okay? Repent and believe. Repent and trust. And I think we need to make sure that that message is not confused and that the words we use are not confounded. It's not repent and become a better person and maybe God will let you in. Or repent and live a moral life and then God will let you in. Repent and get rid of the addictions that are in your life and then God may let you in. No, it's repent and believe and let God take care of the rest, all right? Because that happens when his Holy Spirit is inside of you. I'm not putting down morality. I'm not putting down anything that goes along with sin sin or promoting sin, but I'm going to tell you that the beginning of salvation is not you cleaning yourself up with some kind of human-based repentance, but it is repentance turned toward God saying, I believe your gospel. I believe it from front to back. I believe that Jesus died. I believe that Jesus buried. I believe that Jesus was resurrected to new life, and that is where life begins, not with me cleaning myself up. Folks, the message of the gospel is that you must repent and believe, all right? Repent and believe, and you will never, ever experience what it means to be a Christian if you just walk by the pool, your foot in the water. Check it out. Now, repent and believe. 
because the message is worth it. And if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, our preaching, our message is in vain. But because Jesus has been raised from the dead, our message is true. Our message is worthy of your trust. Our message is that God loves you. Come to him today. All right? But how about this? It's not just that our message, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then our message is in vain. But how about this? If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. Our faith is in vain. All right? You are still in your sins. Okay? Your faith is in vain. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, you are still in your sins. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. If there is no resurrection from the dead, if there's no perfection that's coming in the future, all right, then right now, it just tells us that that the part of the gospel of Jesus Christ means that, yeah, he died, buried, resurrected, that goes together. And if he just died... Okay, so that you could be forgiven of things that were there in your past and not be accounted righteous for the future, then, hey, you know what? What if God forgave you just for things in the past, but, you know, you're not covered for the future. You're not covered for the future because there is no hope of anything that's new. There's nothing that's perfect that's actually coming. You're just there, all right? You're still in your sins. That means not that you're sinless, Paul's not telling the Corinthians that. And if you read this book, you find out very quickly they're not sinless. They've got lots and lots and lots of problems. We talked about that on Easter Sunday, all right? Corinth, not a great place to truly build your faith under great circumstances, all right? Count great circumstances being high immorality, high murder. You talk about disparity between rich and poor. Yeah, that's Corinth, all right? It's not a place where you can just say, I'm going to escape the world. You're very much in the world there in Corinth. Folks, this church had problems. They were still not sinless, and they weren't going to be sinless until the day that Jesus called them home or until Jesus came back. But what he's saying here is that you are still in your sins means that God still holds your sin against you, all right? You think about your single defining characteristic. If other people looked at you and said, just connect them up with one word to say, this is who you are, or this is how I'm going to define you, what would they say, all right? What would they say? And you'd come up with your own minds. Maybe you'd say, driven, all right? Maybe you would say, ambitious. Maybe you would say, all right, pretty, Or maybe you would say cheerful. Maybe you would say great spirit, okay? Maybe. I've always asked, you know, sometimes I get to do, uh, uh, not dedications, but recommendations for kids that are going to Christian school because they'll ask me, they'll ask me from time to time if I could have one word to describe this child that's going in. I have to come up with one word for your child to, to, to give them a recommendation, all right? And it's, 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 a, it's a great exercise to be able to go into. But you think about that, not just for children, but you think about that perhaps for yourself as well. What would people say about you if they just had one word? Listen, apart from Christ, the one word that would define you more than anything else would be lost. It would be sinful. It would be separated from God. But in Christ... Our faith tells us that we're not defined by our sin anymore. You're not defined by your sin anymore. And that if you come to Christ, maybe even this morning, you're no longer going to be defined by the person that you once were, but that God is going to see you in his son. And when God sees you in his son, folks, you can't get any better than that. You will never be any better than that. Folks, that's what God's message that he gives to us to preach, to tell us that our belief in Jesus, that one moment in time, perhaps when we became a Christian, or that our continued belief in Jesus, as we would say, the moment that we are being saved, we talked about that last week, saved in the past, saved now, saved for the future, that's all operating in the, in the realm of faith in some sense. But it tells us that the moment that we are in Christ, that we believe in him by grace through faith, we are different. And if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, all right, if he's not worthy, if he's not trustworthy enough to give us a future, 
then he's certainly not trustworthy to ever take care of anything in the past, right? The resurrection is the future. But if there is no future, listen, their future hope, there is no past faith. You see, here's the difference. We'll talk a little bit more about hope here in just a minute. But faith looks back. Faith looks back, you know. We live in the present, but we look back to the past, all right? Look back to the past, especially when it comes to the, our, our spiritual lives. We remind ourselves that God has been faithful in the past, that when I called out to him, when I trusted him, when I gave him my life, guess what? You know, it's not just that I offered it to him and he said, nah, no thanks. You ever done that with anybody, all right? They offer you something, you say, nah, I don't want it, all right? God never does that. God never does that. When you genuinely say, here's my life, he doesn't look at you and go, oh, my gosh, really? Seriously? You could have at least cleaned up a little bit beforehand. You could have at least, could have at least tried a little bit better. God doesn't just hold his nose and say, okay, I'll take you. He welcomes you in. The prodigal son, the father runs to him, grabs him, carries him in. Listen, when God takes you, he holds you, all right? He no longer defines you by what you once were. You are his child. You are loved by him, and he holds you, and he intends to keep you, all right? Your faith is in vain. If there is no hope for the future, then, yeah, you can't look back to the past and say that God really did anything. Just keep trying. Just keep going on. You know, uh, you, you might get over the hump. You may not. Just Let's just keep going. Paul says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because, yes, if Christ isn't dead, read for, raised from the dead, our message is in vain. Yeah, that's true. And if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then your faith that you had in the past is in vain as well. But because Christ is raised from the dead, because he is trustworthy for the future, and because you can be confident in your future in him, you can also be confident in what he's done for you in the past. It's a part of the story part of the story that God is telling in your life. Listen, Christ has been raised from the dead. Your faith is not in vain. Your faith, your faith is everything. But what about this? Message is in vain. Christ isn't raised from the dead. Faith is in vain. Christ isn't raised from the dead. How about your hope? How about your hope? Well, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, Paul says, you know, all those people that have died, or as he would use the phrase, fallen asleep, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just gone, all right? You have a goal. Jesus is coming back. Stay alive until then, okay? Stay alive until then. Let me tell you something. If, if we've been trying to stay alive since the day that Jesus resurrected and since the day Jesus ascended into heaven, we have a really bad track record, all right? really bad track record. In fact, Paul, in the first few verses here, and this talks about how that some people who saw the resurrected Jesus personally, all right, some have fallen asleep. Some are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Does Paul mean that they're lost because they've died? That there is no hope for anything that has come because they didn't stay alive until the fact when Jesus can make them new? Oh, no, absolutely not. He says, no. He says, yeah, your hope for the future is a real hope because even if you die here in this life, you know, Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. And Jesus was raised a new life. Why do you think that you can't have that happen to you as well? Why is it that, that, that somehow or another you're not going to be covered by that particular promise of God? He says, no. You have that kind of hope too, all right? You see, faith looks back, but hope looks to the future. Can you imagine a world where everything is just hopeless? You couldn't imagine it for very long because life wouldn't be worth living. Life would be terrible. You know, if there are nothing, there's really nothing to look forward to. You know, things might be good for a little bit here on this earth, but here on this earth, this is just as good as it's going to get. Just as good as it's going to get, and I just need to bear it up and suck it up and keep moving forward without any hope for anything that is yet to come. I'll tell you something. If you really want to, and, and, and this, is, this is a part of the, of this, just think about our culture today. We think about suicide in our culture today. We think about people taking their own lives today. Hopelessness 
drives that in so many ways that I can't get over this. I will never be able to imagine anything better. I won't, can't imagine any kind of future that's better because of my existence in it. That's very much a part of the reality in which we live when people take their own lives. But I'm going to tell you something. If you take collective hope from everyone, you think suicide rates are bad now. Let me tell you, without hope, people lose the will to live. You've got to believe in something. You've got to have hope for the future. And a lot of people may have hope. We would say shallow hope because any hope that's not in Christ is not a full hope. It's based upon what you're doing, not upon what God has done. It's based upon what you hope God will do if he feels like it on any particular day rather than a hope in God that he has promised this and that he always keeps his word. Let me tell you, the hope for the future is based in the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that just as he has been raised from the dead, you and I will be raised from the dead. It's not all history, but Jesus, yeah, what if? No, this is true. That's not what if, it's because of. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we can preach confidently and we can invite you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we can call you to trust in a God who that you can have great and tremendous and rock-solid faith in because he always keeps his promises, not just for in the past, but in your hope for the future. You have hope. You have this faith that is real because the message is real, because Jesus is real, because Jesus has been raised from the dead, and that is our reality today. Folks, this is why we preach. This is why we call you to call people to faith in Jesus, to a real hope that no matter what this life throws at us, no matter where we find ourselves in it, that our God has done something that only he can do. And to be raised from the dead, yeah, that's pretty amazing. And to promise that all who are identified with his son in his resurrection from the dead in the full story of the gospel, that's a resurrection that they're going to have as well. Folks, that's a message worth proclaiming. That makes us different because it tells us that our God is always, always going to work on behalf of those who love him and those who are called for his purposes, those who are called by Jesus' name, that his promises apply to us. And yes, this life ain't all that there is. This life is but a foretaste in some sense. The best moments in this life are just a nipple at the greater piece of the pie. There's something that's better that's coming because of the resurrection, because we Believe in this Jesus. This faith that looks back to say, hey, God kept his promises. God keeps his promises in this life. And God will keep his promises in the future. Folks, we hold on to that. It's not alt history. Paul says we don't live in alt history. This is the surest thing that has ever happened. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Repent, believe, be confident, be sure, be hopeful, be expectant because it matters. It's the message we preach. It's the faith we hold. It's the hope that looks to the future. Folks, let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Father, today we thank you for this message that because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we have a message worth proclaiming that our gatherings together are not in vain. That because of this message, God, we have a faith that's worth holding, reminding ourselves of what you've done in the past to bring us into your family by forgiving us of our sins. But God, we only not only have those two things, the message and the faith, but we also have a hope that transcends this life and that ultimately carries us home. God, today, there may be people in this world there may be people in this room that are struggling, wondering, God, whether or not things are going to get better. God, we can't make any promises about whether or not things are going to get better now. But God, we can say with assured hope 
that they will one day. And that this life, God, this life that we live now is but a breath, but a breath in the greater life that is to come for us in eternity. Just a mere fraction of our existence. God, today we thank you for that hope. Father, I pray that as Christians here in the room that we would press on in godliness and holiness, not to earn your love, but because we have already received it in Christ and because we have hope for the future, God, as your kingdom citizens, as your children today in this world. We have hope in this new creation that is coming, and we want to reflect your glory until that day. May that be true in our lives. But, Father, we also pray today for those who may be coming along just testing things out, kicking tires, dipping their foot in the water. God, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you've broken through in their lives to show them, God, by showing us, first of all, how empty we are in and of ourselves, how full you are. And how the message, the gospel, has the power to take us from nothing to something. To take us from empty to full. To take us from hopelessness to full hope. God, today I pray that you would break through in that life. Bring men and women, boys and girls, into your kingdom by grace through faith as they hear and believe the gospel. We thank you today, God. We love you today, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Folks, today we're going to let you all go here in just a minute, but we do want to mention just a few things. If you have any questions about anything that you've seen or heard here at Gateway this morning, find somebody wearing a name tag. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to introduce you to true hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, mention the connection card a little bit ago if you Take care of that. Take it by the guest services counter on your way out. Also, Church Center app, that little QR code as well. You can use that to connect. Three events, though, that we want to talk about this morning, just in brief, just about things that are coming up. Our fellowship meal is coming up next Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. A lot of you guys have already registered for that um, online or at the guest services counter. We just need to know who's coming, all right, how many's coming. We're asking everybody that's coming as well to bring a meat and a side or dessert, okay? Okay, so meat, side, or dessert, not side or dessert, okay? Meat, all right, and a side or dessert. So everybody's clear on that, all right? Okay, so that means that you can stop and get a bucket of chicken, all right? And that means that you can bring some green beans. Or you can bring a bucket of chicken and then bring a banana pudding, all right? Okay, or if you really wanted to, you can bring a bucket of chicken, you can bring a side and a dessert, okay? Just make sure that you bring a meat because we want to make sure that we have enough to be able to feed everybody, all right? So just sign up at the guest services counter or you can do so on the church center app. That's next Sunday afternoon here at Gateway at 5 p.m. Also, remember, men's camping trip is coming up in just a little while as well. We're talking about the first weekend, first Friday and Saturday in the month of May. You can sign up at the guest services counter for that. It's five bucks, or you can also do it at the, um, you can also do it at the, um, uh, uh, on the Church Center app as well. And also, too, if you want to come, how many of you guys used to sleep outside? All right. How many of you guys no longer want to sleep outside? All right. I am very firmly in the latter category. All right. I'm planning on coming. I'm planning on coming, but, but I'm, I'm going to be hanging out with you guys and leaving. But if you want to spend the night, we're going to have great things that are going to be going on. So, yes, we've already had some questions about that. You guys feel free to come. You guys feel free to stay. You guys feel free to, 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 to leave at the end of the night as well. But we're looking forward to a great time. I think it's May the 3rd and 4th here in just a few weeks down the road. And then one final thing, Mother's Day is always a very good day for us here at Gateway Community Church. We love to celebrate all of our ladies. But as a part of Mother's Day, we are going to have baby dedication as a part of our 930 service. If you have a child that you would like to have dedicated, we're talking about like five and under, you can stop by the guest services counter. You can register for that, or you can also do that on the Church Center app as well.
Folks, we're ready to, to um, let you guys go here in just a few moments, but we would be remiss if we did not let you guys go by reading the scriptures together. So we're going to read our benediction for the month from Psalm 115, verse 15. Let's all stand together. Let's all read God's word together, and then let us be dismissed in the power of the gospel. The scriptures read like this. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. May God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday here at Gateway.